Okay, well, let's get going. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, this is our eighth and final uh, forum for the uh, LO, for LOSN for 2021. Um, tonight, uh, uh, the topic is Beyond Net Zero, Restorative Buildings, the PA story. And what we're gonna focus on is leading edge green building practices that are occurring locally uh, with uh, PA Engineering, a local firm, as one of the foremost practitioners of this work, uh, as far as I know, certainly in the country, maybe the world. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the Lake Oswego Sustainability Network, and there's probably only a handful because the list looks uh, that I see that have signed up are a lot of names I know. But uh, just briefly, our network was formed in 2013. Um, our, uh, uh, our mission is to su support sustainability awareness and activities in Lake Oswego. We've got a number of different action teams and over 30 different uh, community partners. And uh, we are uh, uh, gonna say blessed, we are really grateful to have Paul Schreer and his associate uh, Karina Hirschberg um, uh, telling the PAA story tonight. Um, as a little background, Paul and I have known each other about 20 years, that we were part of a group that uh, got together um, uh, about a dozen or so, maybe less than that, people to envision what a fully sustainable building would look like using the natural step uh, sustainability framework. And um, it included uh, uh, developers and car architects, contractors, uh, uh, folks from the Department of Energy, uh, Oregon Department of Energy, and included Paul. And um, we, uh, the group issued a white paper in early 2000 that nobody, everybody agreed nobody could build that building at that time, but it became a vision of where things could go. And it was way beyond the lead rating system. And what really sort of amazed me at that time was Paul was one of the first to, to look at net zero concepts. And he uh, showed us that even at that time, some buildings could be built to the net zero energy uh, level. So that inspired a lot of those folks to really push the envelope. So um, we're delighted to have them. Uh, and uh, basically uh, Paul and his group is, uh, gone beyond some of those concepts of 20 years ago, beyond just net zero to the whole concept of restoration. And that's part of what we're gonna be focusing on tonight. So I am going to turn this over to Paul and stop my screen sharing. And Paul, I'll let you take it, up, take it over. All right, thanks so much for the introduction. Duke, let me uh, share my screen here and go into my PowerPoint mode here. Should be seeing the first slide, Duke. You seeing that? I do. Important stories from around the world. Next, we yeah. turn to Sudan because doctors there say 14 people have been shot yeah. dead. Someone needs to go on mute. Yeah. Let, me, let me take yeah, it. The first one, as we would have expected it to be, was the capital cartoon. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Why doesn't so everybody what, mute themselves? I'm trying to look to see who's not muted. There we go. I yeah. think you got people. Like you got just about everybody. Yeah. So thanks so uh, much for inviting uh, Karina and I. Duke, uh, you actually had a hand in this building from those that group you facilitated. And when we were thinking about it, we were thinking 50 years out. We did a back casting process. Look 50 years into the future to see what's possible. Uh, and we got there 30 years ahead of schedule. So a little bit about PAE, we're an engineering company. We design mechanical systems, electrical systems, lighting systems, telecom, um, mostly on the West Coast, most of our projects. And we're headquartered in Portland and the building you're gonna be seeing is our new headquarters. And we have a lot of fun designing beyond lead. We've done 70 lead platinum ones, but 35 net zero projects, a lot of all electric buildings now at any scale from a million square feet um, to an individual residence. And as part of that, we run a triple bottom line company, People, Planet, and Profits. We just last year became B Corp certified, uh, just like Patagonia. And it served us well in you know, helping us win some you know, 100 best award, employer awards and the 100 best green. We're actually on the Oregon 100 best green 
Hall of Fame because we were at 10 years in a row, uh, 13 now. So a few other buildings you might be familiar with, uh, the Bullet Center in Seattle, that was our first living building that we got a chance to do with Dennis Hayes, uh, the guy that organized the first Earth Day. That one's net zero. You can see the big PV hat on the top of that. Uh, all the way to, you know, uh, this is actually Lake Ridge Middle School, not Lake Ridge High School. Um, they're hoping to do more work in Lake Oswego, but this is a just, just opened six months ago, all electric net zero ready building that uh, hopefully PV will be added to next year. But I just wanted to start with a little bit about the living building challenge. And if you think of a tree um, and an analogy to, to a building, a tree can't move. A tree has a certain energy budget. It's how much sunlight hits its leaves. A tree has a certain water budget, how much rainfall falls at its base. Um, it doesn't create any waste. It has no toxic materials. Um, it's part of an ecosystem. So the whole idea behind a living building is to make a building part of an ecosystem and live within the same budgets that a tree would live in. Within. So that's where net zero energy, net zero water, um, and uh, essentially create no waste. Some stats on the building. It's a five-story building. We just moved in four weeks ago, hot off the press. Duke got a chance to see the 3D version a couple of weeks ago on a tour, 58,000 square feet. Uh, for those who are familiar with the architectural community in Portland, uh, ZGF, the architect and um, uh, uh, Edlin and Company, a, a subsidiary of Girding Edlin, developed it and Walsh was our contractor. But I wanna start 12,000 years ago. Um, the land that our building is on is, was stewarded by the you know, various bands of the Chinook, Clackamas, Cowlitz, uh, Kalupia, Multnomah, and other tribes of the Northwest for 12,000 years. The city of Portland has only been around uh, you know, for 150 years. So if I think what we've done in 200 years in Portland versus the 12,000 years um, that the Native Americans lived on it, we've got a lot to learn from them. And the buildings like this are trying to be, get back to that restorative uh, thinking. So Lewis and Clark probably walked within five miles of this building uh, when they came out in 1805. Um, you know, 45 years later, this is what Portland uh, was looking like. Almost from this, this picture is taken almost from the side of our building. And if you walked into that forest right there, you could probably walk all the way to the coast without seeing um, yeah, another European settler. Um, in the late 1890s, this is what, you know, city of Portland grew very rapidly. Um, the red dot is where we are. For those familiar with Portland, this is the Embassy Suites Hotel. This is the Pine Street Market. These buildings are still there. We are in an historic area intentionally because it gives us solar access. This is the building that was on our site and um, the German Remedy Company was uh, an area that, that uh, people would get treated for alcohol and drug addiction. And some things in our society never seem to change. Uh, for the last 70 years, it's been a parking lot. So we're in this spot here. This is the Willamette River. Uh, we're only a block off the river, it's great. For instance, the Burnside Bridge is a few blocks north of us to get everyone oriented. And this is what it looked like on April 1st, 2020 before the pandemic. <laughs> and I think we, we started, we, we broke ground right when the pandemic was hitting. We're gonna talk a little bit about the design and then uh, the architectural design. And then Karina is gonna talk about some of the systems that make it more like an ecosystem. Promise not to have a lot of formulas in my presentation, but the Fibonacci series and the golden ratio are all throughout this building. And uh, for those of you who remember the Fibonacci series, it's basically each number added to the one behind it. So zero plus one is one, one plus one is two, two plus one is three, three plus two is five, and so forth. If you divide two numbers in the Fibonacci series, you get um, phi, which is essentially a, a, a golden ratio that's found in all kinds of architecture. And we wanted it built, when you, when you look at a building, you say, why does that building work? Um, a lot of times it's because these, the golden ratio you know, and the Fibonacci series are built into the design. Why does, as, as a human species, why are we attracted to that? We find it all over the place. The spirals that are in seashells, that are in roses, that are in hurricanes, that are even in our ga galaxy are all very similar um, to the Fibonacci series. So in architecture, that ratio of the first floor to the second floor, the height of a window to the height of another window is really important. 
So our building, since we're in a historic area, we wanted to pay uh, special attention to that. This building is a, a block away, the Hazel T built building. Um, and the ratios we're sh shooting for, that ratio of um, A to B and two thirds of one floor is, is a fl the same as a floor of another, all plays into how the, sh the building became the size it is and the floor to floor heights. Even the classic Roman architecture has this built into it. So we built those same ratios into the facade of the building at the floor level. And then within the floor level, those same ratios are built in again. So that pattern, which is you don't really discern it without um, you know, kind of knowing why we did it, but it, it feels really good. If you want to see how a building can get built in 90 seconds, that's the core of our building from a seismic standpoint. We have a concrete core. Then um, the rest of the building is cross laminated timber. All that timber that you see going up there went up in about six weeks. Um, so it's amazing when you have a cross laminated timber building, how quickly you can build it. You know, then we built uh, our well insulated facade, our high performance double pane windows. Um, we chose brick as a material on the outside to, um, because we're in a historic district and we wanted to, you know, not match the historic buildings, but be similar to it. Our windows, as you can see them opening and closing in some of these uh, things are, are all operable. Um, and that's, you know, how the building got built over 18 months. This is what it looks like now. Uh, I like to think of it as a jewel box. It's not just beautiful on the facades, even the top of it is really, is really clean. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Karina to talk about the net positive energy. So I'm gonna stop sharing Karina so you can share and advance your slides and then I'll come back at the end. And what Karina is getting ready, let me just mention if you have any questions uh, uh, for Karina, uh, Paul, use chat because when we're, uh, after they're through, they're gonna go look at the, uh, whatever questions you have in chat and try to answer them. So Karina, take it away. All right, do you see? The net positive side, man. Right side. All, all, all good. All good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. So I'm going to talk us through um, some of the systems inside of that jewel box that uh, Paul mentioned, and some of the kind of reoccurring themes that we're going to touch on in this portion of the discussion is that idea of. Um, you know, trying to mimic an ecosystem, and so there's you know kind of two things that come out of that. One is that living within sort of the resource budget of the site, right? Living within balance with what we have available to us. And then two, this idea that in nature, there's no such thing as waste. And so wanting to think about what that could mean in terms of um, building design and how we interact with the systems around us. So we'll start it off by uh, talking about um, energy and the idea of being net positive energy. So if we, you know, net zero energy is that you generate as much on site um, as you use in a year and that equation balances out to be net zero. Um, for living building and for kind of our own desires, we wanted to go one beyond that of thinking of restorative, right, is to be net positive, to generate more than we need so that we are giving back to the systems um, beyond what our own um, system needs. So, uh, of course, the easiest energy to offset is the energy that you don't use. So step one is to try and get yourself as efficient as possible. Um, what we're kind of showing on this um, bar chart here, I know it's a little bit of an eye chart, but um, is looking at typical buildings. So there's this, it's a metric called um, EUI or energy use intensity, which is a way that we evaluate um, the energy use of a building to other buildings, you know, neighboring it. A typical building that was built sometime in the last bunch of years, right? We're coming in, clocking in just over an EUI of 90, right? The codes have improved significantly. Um, and so a code minimum building nowadays um, in, in the Portland area would be around 40, an EUI of 40. Our building is coming in um, just under 20. And this is considered um, really very efficient, um, but this is not the first building that we've done that's had um, an EUI under 20. And it's something that we really believe is possible. And we, we try to bring that to all projects and encourage that. Because the results, right, is that all of that delta, that 80% improvement from a typical building to what we do is all energy that we don't have to generate, right? We're not relying on the system for it and we don't have to generate it back. Um, when we then incorporate what our PV system does, um, you can see we actually come to a, a negative EUI. Um, we are, we're able to contribute back to the system, offsetting not only our own usage, um, but those of some of those around us. 
And, you know, the way that we do that, again, that looking at efficiency first, um, for most buildings, the, the systems that use the most energy um, typically are the mechanical systems. Um, so for heating and cooling ventilation and then lighting. And so one of the first things um, that we look to use and really optimize are these uh, newfangled technologies called daylight and outdoor air. You've maybe have heard of them. Um, they, you know, joking aside, right, this is the where we started <laughs> before we moved our, our clever way into um, the more, you know, modern systems that we see. And so what we try to do, though, with these high performance buildings is using these in, um, you know, using them in beautiful ways, right? Taking these amazing resources that are there and improving upon them and using them in really strategic ways. And so obviously we have beautiful daylight um, throughout the building. And then we also have operable windows that allows us to do passive heating, cooling um, and ventilation um, at times of the year when the either outdoor you know, temperatures or the air quality um, allow for that. In times where it's either too cold, too hot, or unfortunately wildfire season, um, we do also have mechanical systems that provide that. So we have um, radiant floor, um, which uh, is same similar to what we had in the bullet center. It's very efficient. It's also very comfortable. Um, employees walk around in their socks sometimes because it's just so nice and cozy um, to have that radiant floor. And then using ceiling fans to help with the mixing. Um, we don't have recirculating air in this um, building, which is something that is from that health standpoint, obviously a lot of buildings who have recirculating air are kind of thinking about how do they move away from it. Um, so we don't recycle, recycle the air, um, but we do recycle the heat. So we have heat recovery systems that allow us again to get that efficiency. If we've already heated it, we wanna keep that heat um, and keeping that cycling through, through the building. So once we've gotten ourselves very efficient, um, we do you know, make up that, that little bit that's left um, by doing on-site generation. And so, um, as you know, Paul mentioned, our roof is not just a roof, it is a roof, it is also a power station, right? It's where we generate the power that we need um, to, to um, offset our usage on the project. One interesting thing about the system that we've done on this building is that the kind of the the traditional rule on PV design is that you wanted your panels to face um, perfectly due south. It's the most um, optimized orientation um, to have the highest efficiency and the highest generation. And so the rule has always been that you face your panels south. On our project, we actually have them facing east and west, which may sound a little strange for this very high performance building. The reason for doing that though, and there's sort of a move towards, towards this philosophy within the industry is that when you, when you put them east and west, there's kind of two things it does for you. One is that even though you take a little bit of an efficiency hit, you're able to fit more panels onto your roof. And so by doing that, we got more panels, which allowed us to generate more overall energy. So a little bit less efficient, but more total generation, which is important as we're trying to hit that net positive. The other thing it does for us is it changes the amount of hours where we're getting generation. Because we have west facing and east facing, we get more of that early morning light and more of that late evening light. And so what that does is it means more hours in the day, we're generating our own, our, um, our own energy on our site. And that is important from a sustainability standpoint, there's environmental reasons and grid interactive reasons for doing that, but there's also a resiliency reason for doing that, which is the other kind of unique factor of the energy system on the building, is that we have a battery system on the project um, that serves um, some environmental and sustainability purposes, but it also provides resiliency for the project, which is another kind of topic that we're having to become, you know, more, more comfortable with, with dealing with in the building industry. And so what we're able to do is we use that onsite generation, store it in our battery system, and in the event of a major outage, we're able to operate off-grid. Um, portions of the building can operate off-grid. And so much so that in some of the, you know, kind of more optimized times of the year where we, like the summer, for example, where we have lots of daylight, um, potentially can operate portions of the building for as much as 100 days um, off-grid in, in a major event. And this is, this is one I would say one of the kind of interesting um, 
one of the more interesting parts about the building and one of the ones that we stories that we really want to tell on it is that there are systems that we can put into buildings now that are sort of this intersection of sustainability and resiliency and you're able to get both benefits with the same system and that's what this pv and this battery does for us is it brings both of those um, benefits um, to our project um, and as I should also mention, it is a category for um, seismic rating on the building. Um, and so in, in a major Cascadia event, this is probably be one of the only operating buildings in the downtown area. All right, so uh, we covered that roof with PV, as you saw, um, and that, that PV and that roof actually does more, it generates our energy. Um, it's also where we do all of our water collection. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we also squeeze some mechanical equipment up there and a couple other things. So we got a lot of stuff going up on that roof. Um, and we, you can see it was very optimized. We, we really made, we made the best of it. Um, but even with all of that, we did still have a portion of the PV that we needed to be fully um, net positive needs to live somewhere else. We just kind of ran out of room on the building. We can't do that kind of top hat look that we had at the Bullet Center because this is a historic district um, and so the PV can't be visible. And so we had a portion of the system that needed to live somewhere else. Um, and so we wanted to think about that of, okay, if we're gonna put the system somewhere else, what is the best way for us to use it? What is the way that we can put this somewhere that brings the most value, not just to us, but to the community as a whole, right? Because that's part of what living building is, is, is how do we advance the community? And, you know, when we look at sort of what is what is going on in the larger society right now, um, all the West Coast cities are dealing with a, um, a very serious social crisis, right, of um, increased number of people who are experiencing homelessness. In Portland, you know, alone we have every night, um, you know, estimates of around 2,000 people who are sleeping on the streets, um, an additional 2,000 who are sleeping in um, temporary shelter situations, and then beyond that, um, up to 12,000 who are in um, some form of either um, temporary at risk or dangerous housing situations. And so we wanted to think um, not only about the sort of environmental sustainability of what we were doing, but the social equity piece of it and how could we do more with what we were doing on our project. And one of the ideas that came to mind was how we could use our system, our additional PV that we needed to place somewhere um, in a way that could help the social equity element. Um, the timing ended up working out very well. Walsh, who was the contractor on the project, was also working on an affordable housing project that was PV ready, which means they wanted PV, but weren't able to install it. Um, they didn't have a system, they didn't have the budget to a system, and the timing worked out really well when their construction was happening. So we were able to locate the additional PV that we needed to hit our net positive goals on their building. And so with our kind of one-time donation, it will offset their house electric bills for decades, which is money that instead of going to electric company can now go directly back to their programming. Um, so it's kind of a great example of, you know, thinking bigger picture, we can come up with technical solutions that that also bring um, more human solutions to it as well. And, you know, it's not that far away, it is in the community and wanting to do something that was directly impacting, um, you know, our community. All right, so energy, precious resource, water, also precious resource um, and how how do we you know how do we be a tree <laughs> in a downtown location um, with our precious resource of water so first again it's it's always better to just use a little bit less um, and so um, in our case you know being very efficient in how we were using our water um, but then going to that idea of what was a tree used well a tree uses rainwater so that means that we need to be using rainwater and so all of our water use on the site um, will be provided by the rainwater that falls on our site and so the way that we do that is there's kind of if we go and we go back to this analogy of, of thinking about an ecosystem right water water cycles right we think of watersheds it's, it's a cycle so first thing you do is you collect your rainwater um, we bring it in we do an initial treatment um, of it to bring it to potable water standards and then we turn it into hot and cold water just the same way as you do if you're connected to um, you know a municipal system right so we use our our treated rainwater um, for all of our typical potable water uses so our you know our drinking water our sinks our showers um, and then we recapture that, right? Because again, we think cycles, what is a cycle? Um, and so then from there, we um, 
pull that back into our gray water system, and then use that for the, the sources that don't need to have drinking water. Um, my husband always says that when future generations look back at uh, our current era, the thing that they will shake their head at the most is the fact that we use drinking water in our toilets. Um, and so there's not a reason to do that. Therefore, we don't do that. Um, we use our, our captured or recaptured gray water and use that for the toilets. And then from there, we have a last step. And this actually introduces um, water and then as a nutrients piece too, I'll talk about in a second. Um, we capture the, uh, what is typically known as the waste that comes from um, our waterless urinals and our compost toilets. And we recapture that because again, in nature, there is no waste, right? This is actually nutrients, it's a nutrient system. And so we capture those nutrients and we process them. So that way they can go back into the nutrient cycle that they need to return to. And so we do that through, again, we have a waterless urinal system that allows us for um, nutrient capture for that system and then composting toilets, which is unusual for a, uh, a uh, commercial building, but you know, it's uh, the wave of the future, just know it. Um, and so then that, again, that allows us to complete, we sort of fix our water cycle, and then we also fix our nutrient cycle all within the site of um, the building. And the nutrient cycle is an interesting one because... And, and Karina, just one, one point on that too, in, in the process of doing that, we're making a liquid fertilizer and selling about $50,000 of it a year. So for all the gardeners on the calls, if you need liquid fertilizer, we've got some for you. We know a source, yes. Um, <laughs> And that's, it is an interesting one, right? Is again, we talk about waste versus, you know, what is really a waste. Um, we, we did want to address that one, address the water cycle and then address the nutrient cycle, right? Because we do have somewhat of a strange system that we currently work on where we treat nutrients as waste and then we manufacture, you know, in chemical facilities, nutrients to replenish that. And so wanting to see if there's a way that we can fix that within um, building systems. All right, so the last little bit is on net zero carbon. Um, and I will say industry jargon here, carbon is sort of a, a less of a mouthful way of saying greenhouse gas emissions, because that's ultimately what we're trying to solve um, with the climate crisis and with buildings, right, is reducing the emissions impact of buildings. And so the question is, is can you get to a point where a building has zero emissions, right? And there's one other element to this. So we've talked about energy, we've talked about water. These are called operating emissions. So the emissions associated with the operations of you know, a building or a home. There's a third category called embodied emissions. And embodied emissions essentially says that to build a building, there's emissions associated just with building it, right? Just the materials of it. And so there's that embodied emissions piece. And one way to think of this is you can kind of think of it as an emissions debt. And so business as usual, we build a building, so we have that debt, and then we operate the building, which means we continue to add to that debt year after year after year, right? The emissions just increase. A net zero building, we still have a debt, right? Because we've still built something. So we have an emissions debt. The good news is, is that we don't continue to add to it, right? It's operating debt is paid in full every year, but we never actually pay down that initial emissions debt that we've taken on. And so where we really ultimately wanna get and where we try to think about it with living buildings and with our building is, is there a way for us to pay down that debt, acknowledging that there is some emissions associated with just building a building, right? But is there a way that we can minimize what that first debt is? And then eventually, hopefully within a short time of the building's life, pay it down in full and then move ourselves into a, a place of positive, right? To pay down the other emissions debts that exist in the world. And can we do that with a building? So for our building, um, obviously we've talked about the operations part. We did also take a real close look at that embodied emissions and the CLT, the cross laminated timber that Paul mentioned, those beautiful, the beautiful wood structure. That's actually one of the solutions for that reducing that initial debt by using timber instead of something like concrete or steel. Um, and so our, you know, our embodied emissions, a 45% reduction um, of a typical building just in that initial one. And then with our operational emissions savings, right? We're making that easier to pay off. And then by being net positive, 
we're able to, over time, we have a path to pay down that emissions debt to reach us to a point where we're net zero carbon and then ultimately net um, positive. So that's, we kind of got all the, all the parts and pieces in there. Energy, water, materials, um, equity, seismic, nutrients. Um, and then Paul's going to talk a little bit um, later here on the investment piece. But before we get into that, I figured we should actually show you show you the building. So we do have a couple slides in here, um, but we'd love for everyone to come visit it in person. It is it is a beautiful space. Um, we're all really enjoying working in it. This picture is actually an interesting story on it. The trees you see in the window there, there was um, a few street trees um, that unfortunately did not make it through the construction process. We knew that ahead of time, wanted to be kind of respectful of that resource and be intentional in, in how um, you know we, we used it. Um, and so that beautiful uh, wood desk that you see there is made from those trees. So they the trees um, were uh, reclaimed, um, processed, and then turned into um, it. So they have remained on site in a new form, in a new life, um, and are a beautiful part of kind of our welcoming lobby. Um, you know, wanting to continue to, you know, bring kind of that ecosystem piece and make it part of the experience of the project. So we had um, a local artist painted um, a mural on each of each of our floors that um, kind of pays tribute to different ecosystems within Oregon. Um, and it's a beautiful kind of biophilia element um, of the spaces. And it said lots of daylight. This is our, our decany, um, a deck of balcony. Uh, those windows all are uh, movable. And so in nice um, summer days, they can open up and it feels like you're, feels like you're sitting on a, on a nice balcony. Um, we do also have sort of the urban ag piece. So those are all um, planter boxes that are in our, our decany windows. Um, lots of discussion on what we're gonna grow in it. Um, a lot of discussion about tomatoes and, and basil. You can make your own salads for lunch right out of right out of the windows. Um, just some more kind of views, lots of gathering spaces, really wanting to, you know, facilitate um, sort of that sense of community within the building. Stairs, uh, we have this idea of the, the desirable stair, um, wanting people to want to take the stair instead of taking the elevator um, and making it an appealing choice. Um, and I will say it, it is good. I get my steps in. Whenever I work in the office, I get my steps in. Um, yeah, and I think that's kind of it. So I'll hand it over to Paul. Yeah, so a lot of people uh, ask, well, how much does the building cost? And the reality is, um, Tenants really don't care how much a building costs. Um, and what what's, might sound a little counterintuitive, investors also don't care what a building costs. What a tenant cares about is how much they pay in rent. And what an investor cares about is their return on investment. So at PAE, we wanted to live our values. So we were willing to pay a 10% premium in rent. Um, and uh, our investors, we're looking for a 10% internal rate of return um, over a 10 year period. So the three tens, you know, in terms of it's hard to remember the financials on any project, but the three, if you can remember three tens, 10% increase in rent, 10% return for our investors and a 10 year hold. And the 10 year hold is because it's in what's known as an opportunity zone. Every city in the country has opportunity zones uh, that, that provides some capital gains uh, benefits. If you hold an investment for 10 years, you don't have to pay capital gains on that. So this is the first developer-driven living building in the world. The other ones have been built by foundations like the Bullitt Foundation or uh, schools like we did one down in Georgia Tech or other nonprofits. But we've shown that you can do this and make a profit, do well by doing good. Um, so that's the kind of commercial side. I'll close the presentation with um, a little more uh, personal side, how I made my house net zero. So, um, if you come over, uh, in most houses, if they use natural gas, these are the five appliances that use it. Your water heater, your dryer. Some people have a natural gas fireplace, a stove, and a furnace. That's it. There's only five things that typically use gas in your home, um, natural gas. This is my 1967 you know, ranch-style home. And uh, if you come visit, if you click a little, little, little next slide there, just be careful. You go the right way. So you want to head to Camelot. Uh, for those uh, my Python fans. So if you uh, go to the back of my house, you'll notice in the upper right-hand corner, I have a solar hot water heating system that I installed almost 20 years ago. Um, I actually wouldn't do that again because now 
heat pump hot water heaters are so efficient that that combination with PV panels, you don't even have to have that piece of equipment up there. So if you advance uh, the slides, I had a specific challenge in my house in that my wife is a professional chef. She likes uh, gas cooking. Uh, it took me a little while to convince her that she could get better performance out of an induction cooktop. Um, and we have actually not only made, well, I have not, I've not only convinced Joyce, but on our commercial kitchens that we do for companies like Google, some of the professional staffs are now saying they wouldn't go back. So the, the temperature control is actually more accurate with an induction stove. Um, so you don't have to worry about melting your chocolate. Uh, Joyce gives me a hard time. She says, uh, Paul, Paul, with the induction, I'm not able to flambe. So that is something that's a little bit more difficult. I bought her a blowtorch so she can make her creme brulee and flambe whenever she wants. So we converted my cooktop. Um, I had 20 year old dryer, washer dryer, converted the old gas dryer to electric, pretty simple. Um, a lot of these appliances have been in the house for 25 years, so they're getting to the end of their life. I upgraded them. The next appliance I upgraded was my gas furnace, which was also over 20 years old. And the side benefit of installing a heat pump is we have air conditioning for the first time. There's only so much you can sail your house when you have a, sum a summer as hot as we had last summer. So I was very happy to have air conditioning for the first time. And if you look out back, you know, I have a condensing unit there. In some of the pictures of the PA living building, there were, there were three of those in the corner um, for a 58,000 square foot building. You know, this is the one I have in my outdoor condensing unit. So that got my house all electric. I have an electric car. So to power it, the roof of my house is a little too uh, shaded. So I couldn't put the PV on the roof. So I put it um, in my backyard. That's a 10 kW PV system. And it's really hard. I don't know if you do another click if it'll show up. Yeah, there it is. Um, so I've had it since 92, 2018, so a little over uh, three years now. And you can see the offsets. It's the equivalent to me not driving 63,000 miles, which is probably more than I'll drive the rest of my life. Um, so that combination got my house uh, net zero energy, all electric. And I uh, proudly show off where my gas meter was. I have repainted that for you, so it's not, it doesn't look quite like that. But the meter is gone. And that means my, my gas bill has gone to zero. So if I share my, my bills, um, you know, this is, and you can do one more click. You can see before I had electric gas and gasoline from my car. After the conversion, my 2,700 annual expense on all those things went down to $175. So I'm saving about $2,500 a year, which means monthly I'm saving a little over $200 a year. And how did I pay for all this? Well, a, three, a home equity loan at 3% was only $178 a month. So I'm actually cash flow positive. I did all that. I'm cash flow positive in year one. And as electricity or natural gas actually is, is supposed to go up 40% this year, um, I am now immune to all those increases. And if they went up at typical inflation rates, I just start saving more and more cash each year. So you can do uh, electrify your home in a cash flow positive way. And I think that is it. So thank you, Duke, for inviting us. I saw a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I will uh, take a crack at, at, at those. Um, first one is, if you don't recycle air, how do you cool the building on hot days? Very good question. So the radiant heating system that Karina talked about is actually a radiant heating and radiant cooling system. So we run chilled water through the floor uh, in the summertime, which keeps the, which cools off the floor and provides cooling. We also um, have uh, a, a, a coil, a cooling coil in our heat recovery units that provide the outside air so that uh, after we recover the energy, if, it, if it's a particularly hot day, we, we cool that off too. So the combination of radiant cooling for the floor and a little bit uh, trimming the, the ventilation system. And the ducts are very small for those that have been duped in the building. There's not a lot of duct work that runs around. That's a side benefit of having radiant cooling. The other question, that little uh, summary of how the building will pay down the debt over time is confusing. So one way to think about um, the embodied energy portion is some people may, may offset your, your CO2 use at, you know, uh, at the personal level. So if I take a flight, I typically offset the CO2 that's emitted during my flight. What we did is we calculated the embodied energy of every material in the building from the wood to the desk, to the ductwork, to the, you name it, added all that up. And we did a one-time offset. So we did 
Um, I think we were doing a few planting trees, but I'm not sure what the final offsets were. So that essentially brought the embodied energy down to zero. And then since our op there's no operational energy, um, that, that essentially is how we get negative over time. This building is designed to last 500 years. It's you know category four seismic, as Karina mentioned, which is the same as a hospital or a fire station. Um, so with on-site energy, on-site water, that level of resiliency in a 500 year building, um, we, we feel will be, you know, will be carbon negative very quickly. Other questions, feel free to raise your hand. There is Inter another, interact. Yeah, uh, Paul, one? there is another question from uh, Dorothy Atwood. Maybe you can. Oh, there we go. Yeah, were there challenges in getting the composting toilets and gorgeous system approved? Um, yeah, uh, the short answer is there almost were. We have been through this one one at a time at the Bullet Center. When we sent our plans in to the plumbing inspector, he really didn't know what to think about this building. Uh, it's the first one he's ever gotten that way. And it was a bit confusing. He wasn't sure what to do. So what we did is say, hey, are you willing to take a field trip with us? And two of our energy engineers um, drove him up to Seattle. He got a chance to see the Bullet Center. He got a chance to talk to the building engineer in the Bullet Center, understand how they all work. And we said, we're going to do a better version of that because we have vacuum flush toilets and we did a bunch of improvements. That helped them understand it. Um, so that uh, got the compost and toilets approved, approved. The gray water is not too difficult to approve in the city of Portland. There's lots of precedents for that. The harder thing to approve was rainwater to potable water. So we are literally our own water district. So we have to do the testing you would with any water district. Some of these things are not necessarily scalable. We wouldn't recommend that every building try to do that. Some things are better done at the municipal scale where, um, but we can do it if our municipal scale systems were more like ecosystems, I'd be more comfortable with it. Right now, there's still a little bit industrial scale to them that's not recycling all the nutrients the way we uh, would do it. Um, uh, there aren't any odor issues. We, uh, we have fans on the compost and we have a backup fan. For some reason, we did not put a backup fan in the bullet center. That was a mistake because when you go to maintain that one fan, there are odor issues. It turns out those fans are doing something. So uh, we have two fans at this building and they're on the, the battery, um, Karina's batteries. So even if there is a power outage, we have those on battery backup. So um, no water issues. Thanks, Dorothy. Well, another issue about uh, the living building is the uh, selection of the material, you know, that uh, with a red list and toxic uh, material. Yeah, what, yeah, what thanks, for, thanks for bringing that up. So there are, there are um, within the living building challenge, there's a number of materials you're not allowed to use. Some of them are obvious, like, um, you know, asbestos and other things. Others are less obvious. So, so there's no PVC in the building. Right. And PVC is fairly inert once it's in the building. There's PVC piping systems likely in your homes or in your irrigation systems. So it's fairly inert. It doesn't hurt us in the building, but the manufacturing of uh, PVC is a big deal. So um, the people who work in those factories and the communities around those factories are affected. So the red list goes not just to the people in the building, but it's the whole supply chain and others that might be affected. So there's a, uh, I don't know exactly how many, I think there's 24, but maybe 30 materials on the red, red list. Those are really, there's over 300 chemicals in those. So we look every single material in this building and there's I think 3,127 that we analyzed to make sure there was none of those chemicals in it. Some of those conversations lead to manufacturers changing their products, um, like some of the backings on roofing material, for instance. Uh, sometimes the manufacturers have never even asked. They really don't know what's in some of their products. So, um, the wiring in this building, most wiring has PVC coating. We have uh, what's affectionately known as hippie wire in this building. It's not a PVC coating. And ironically enough, hippie wire was developed by the US Navy um, because submarines, when there are fires on submarines, the wire burns and they didn't want uh, the sailors dying of the toxicity. So they came up with a material that is ironically now called hippie wire that we use. Well, can you also speak about the certification process, the difference between, say, getting certified with LEED and with the yeah. building? Yeah, so bo both systems have a fairly rigorous, you know, you submit a lot of data on your building. The fundamental difference is the LEED certification around energy is based on your energy model. We did lots of energy modeling on this building, as you can imagine, in terms of trying to predict it. With the living building, it doesn't matter what the energy model says. 
you get the certification a year later after you've proven that you're net zero energy. So we're, we're technically on the path to certification. Next fall is when we get certification. That's when you have to prove that you're net zero energy, prove that you're net zero water. So it's not just tr trusting the architects and engineers. There has been some unfortunate situations on some lead buildings where the energy performance was so far off from what was predicted that you know there were some claims that those buildings were greenwashing what they were doing. Can't greenwash a living building because you got to show them your energy budget bill was zero. We have a couple more questions, Paul, if you can take a look at chat. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Uh, regarding building comfort, does the radiant heating cooling system require the use of temperature set points that are outside the normal parameters? Um, the nice thing about radiant heating and cooling systems is it allows for set points that are outside the normal comfort zones. So we can actually set the building at 68 degrees um, in the wintertime, which most people um, or many people might find cold, but since it's a radiant floor, you're actually quite comfortable. So um, if you think of what, is, what makes um, us comfortable, there's actually six variables. It's the temperature that you know, you, your thermostat says. Um, it's actually the radiant temperature in the space. So in our old building, we were in a hundred year old building with single pane windows. We could heat that space to 75 degrees, but if you're sitting next to a single pane window, your body is radiating your energy to that window and you're gonna feel cold almost no matter what temperature is inside. So the radiant temperature is important. The other uh, uh, factor is, is there air movement? That's one of the reasons we have the fans. In the summertime, you can increase the step point in the building well, for two reasons. We have the radiant floor to keep you cool and we have some air motion that you can generate. And then your clothing level is another one, the humidity level is another one. So there's lots of people associate just one of the human comfort variables so much as just temperature, but if you control all six of them, you end up with a fundamentally more comfortable space. That was a long answer to a short question. Um, how big is our water tank? So our cistern is 71,000 gallons and it's actually not a tank. It was built, when we built the foundation of the building, we built, uh, we essentially put a waterproof barrier on the concrete foundation uh, around most of the building and then pour the water in it. So it's not like a tank, like you'd think of a, a, you know, a traditional tank. It's, it's really our building. We, we made the cistern part of our building, which saved us some money. Dorothy has a follow-up question to that. Uh, how did you calculate what you needed? Ah, that is very good. We went back. 50 years of rainfall history, and we designed the cistern to provide all of our water needs for the worst drought in 50 years. And then what happened? This year we had a drought worse than that. <laughs> so we wanted to test our building's water system. We, the system was re cistern was ready to go in April. It did not rain for five months. Um, we are just recently being able to test a rainwater system because if it turns out if you put potable water in your rainwater tank, you're not really testing your filtration system. So, um, you know, part of the effect of climate change, as you all know, is the droughts are getting tougher uh, and the rainfall is coming in different, in different forms, you know, a lot more rain in a shorter period of time, which makes calculating the size of cisterns even tougher. Anybody else? Oh, here we go. One more question. A little off time, but as soon as we uh, start engineering management graduate with an interest in net zero positive, do you have any tips on how to align my potentially carbon intensive career with my interests? I would say that um, you have a fantastic lever. About 40% of the world's carbon is in the building field. Get, join us. In, in designing more buildings, more structures like this and taking that 40% down to zero. Over the next 30 years, our entire planet will be powered by renewable energy. We need more smart people, and I'm, I'm guessing you're a smart person, Brad, to um, be able to do those calculations, to be able to understand how to um, make incremental improvements until, for instance, concrete can be carbon negative. Um, there's a, you know, I, I think of, you know, all the people joining our firm right now as part of the solution and pulling this down. Um, and if we don't have people who care about doing it, it's not gonna happen. Yeah, add to that, if you're, especially if you're coming at it from the construction side, it 
we there needs to be people committed to this at kind of all stages in it and so having um people who are really you know it's a labor of love this kind of stuff is often a labor of love and having people who are really committed to it and there to make the kind of game time decisions that are critical and and sometimes hard to predict is the kind of the single best way you can do it i we i remember once uh we were looking at the the impact that you can make in personal life versus the impact you make if you're doing large con can you know commercial buildings it's it is one of the single biggest levers that you have access to so it is excellent that you can align <laughs> your your interests and your career and you're in the right spot to do that anybody else have any last uh questions here we've got one from rj cook how can rural areas assist in developing partnerships with urban areas uh, for maybe regional carbon sequestration zones so yeah, one of my uh, interests is connecting the east side of the state with the west side of our state. And there's a couple of ways that that can happen. Um, one is timber. Um, you know, timber is an, still an important, um, you know, product of our state, so to speak. It's renewable. Um, all the timber in our building is FSC certified, which means um, it typically is grown over an 80 year cycle. It's replanted. Um, you can, you could, you could build eight more of these buildings during the, during the life of our building. So I think uh, connecting the rural communities uh, through on the timber side is one way. The other side is the other side of our, uh, the mountains is much sunnier. So, you know, do we put some of our renewable resources on the east side of the state? Um, and it's benefited a lot of farming communities having the wind on that side. I think we can do the same um, in our uh, coastal communities with, with the new uh, wave energy centers that are being, uh, there's um, a great test bed being installed off the, coast, off, the, off the Oregon coast for different wave energy generation. Um, Oregon is essentially the Saudi Arabia of renewable energy. We've got, we've got rivers, uh, we've got tidal, we've got wind, we've got solar, we've got geothermal. Those are the five biggest sources of renewable energy in the world. We have every one of those in our state. Um, so we will be a net exporter of renewable energy, um, you know, likely in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, so, yeah, I think it can tie the east and west, uh, the rural and the urban uh, together. And we need more of that. Um, do you see more of the, this in school designs? Um, yeah, we're seeing in all kinds of buildings, to be honest with you, not just uh, so in K through 12 schools, we're seeing it, we're seeing it at the university level. We're seeing it in corporate headquarters. A lot of the um, tech companies now are tripping over themselves to have beat each other out on the best sustainability goals. So we have this virtual cycle, virtuous cycle, as opposed to you know a cycle going down the drain. Each one is trying to beat the next one. The latest one was there. A lot of them have goals for net zero carbon. Google now has a goal to be net zero carbon every hour of every day, not just over the course of the year like our building is. That's incredibly technically challenging. So we're working with them on that goal. Um, Microsoft wants to offset all their carbon emissions from when the, car, from when the company was founded in the 1980s. Uh, so it's great to see this kind of who can do one better um, at, the, at the corporate level. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, investments now that are you know, shying away from fossil fuels for uh, obvious reasons that are heading in that way. Um, how will those PVs do in heavy snow? Um, fortunately, we don't get that much heavy snow uh, in Portland, but when it does snow slow, we won't get we won't get any capacity out of them. The snow doesn't tend to last too long. Um, we did a project for the Rocky Mountain Institute uh, just south of Aspen in Colorado. The, the snow there was an issue. We, we 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 put those PVs on a much steeper angle, so a little bit of melting would cause all the snow to go off. Um, but snow is really not an issue in in, in our area. Uh, thank you for working on Lake Ridge Middle. All right. Uh, now that we are looking at like uh, the next one, would you do anything differently? Interesting question. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's happening very rapidly is the improvement in heat, heat pump technology. So by the time that project is designed and the, and the equipment is procured, will likely have the ability to um, have more efficient mechanical equipment that was, than was available for the middle, middle school. Um, you know, I'd, I would have liked to see the PV go on when the building was being constructed as opposed to doing after the fact. Um, 
I'd also like to see batteries in the building. We weren't able to afford the batteries. There was a bunch going on that was, you know, we kind of build that school in the middle of COVID and while demoing another school. There was a whole bunch of things that made that project more challenging than hopefully the next one will, will be that unrelated to the construction team or even the design team. But I think it's, it's those incremental improvements. And quite frankly, we'd love to hear from, you know, the principal and the teachers on how, what's, what's working for them and what's not working. Um, so, um, we, we, we always look for that feedback. Larry, I think you should tell Paul what your what your wife is thinking. All right, you got to come off mute, yeah, Larry, to share. <laughs> yeah, so my my wife teaches in the building, and um, you know, it's with with the challenges of managing COVID this year, and you know, with the green light you know, comes, turns to red and we should be closing the windows, but yet we still need to have them open to get the airflow to go. So, you know, they're just, there have been just some logistical challenges that, that they've had to work through, but, um, you know, uh, Tony is, has been really happy with it. You know, we had those the super hot days, how, how well the building, you know, functioned and, but yeah, they're, it would be good to get, to get some really, yeah. If, if you have some some specific things that you want feedback on, um, I'd I'd be glad to go and help you to gather that information and and um, get that to you. That'd be great. I, I'd appreciate that, Larry. Yeah, I'll I'll do can do can get us in touch. Um, and and, okay. and just so everyone knows, when we design a building, we do not design a building for 110 degree day, right? That would, if you did that, everything would be oversized. And um, so we design a building. There's a thing called the the, the design temperature. In Portland, that's about 91 degrees. Doesn't mean the temperature is not over 91, but we typically only get about 1% of the days over 91. And you can push your system during that 1% to get it a little bit cooler. So the fact that the building actually performed well when it was well over 100 means the mass of the building. Um, you can pre-cool it at night. You can start, you know, sailing the building the way you would a sailboat um, to 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 overcome those days because you don't really want to design it for the hottest day of the year. Spend too much in first cost. And all the systems are less efficient because they're never operating at their peak, uh, their, their peak efficiency. Um, all right. Any okay. other questions? Well, Paul, Karina, thank you so much. And, wait a minute. Um, wait a minute. I have another question. Go, I don't know if they... you've ever done a rec centers with pools. Oh, oh there we go. Yeah. Um, uh, so yes, we have designed rec centers. I don't know if we've done our first net zero one now. We are in the process of designing the YMCA for uh, City of Eugene. And uh, there's a discussion on, can you do an all electric rec center? You know, because big pools, um, if you don't, uh, the, the solar hot water system for a pool, it, you know, doesn't work so well in the winter time and on gray days. And typically the way you would overcome that is a gas fired boiler. Um, so getting a net zero rec center, uh, Karina, do you know if we've pulled that off yet? But I don't, I think it's no, possible. No, but it'd be a good, yeah, challenge we should tackle. <laughs> we love big problems, Dorothy. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, uh, I would encourage all of you who are listening to this to go visit Paul and Karina's new building and go up to Seattle and see the uh, Bullet Foundation. It's one thing to hear how great this is from a presentation like this. It's something else to actually visit these buildings and see what's going on. Uh, in fact, Paul, I think you said up in uh, Seattle, the uh, tours are- Yeah, 5,000 people a year go to that building. Okay. Which are, commercial office buildings are not generally set up to have 5,000 tours. Looks like we've got a question from Jennifer on her hands raised. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Well, two things. Um, kind of following up on the Lake Ridge comment that you made about that you would love to hear from the principals and the teachers. Yeah. Uh, my, my kiddo is in the architecture class in eighth grade there. Oh, And it would right. be fabulous actually if you maybe you were, while you're already sending them to Larry, send some of the questions that would be specific for the architecture kids. Oh, uh, one right. of the challenges that they had in a recent unit of instruction was the, the Palisade school in our neighborhood is um, going to be kind of reconfigured for a new language program. And they were given challenges to do living building designs oh. um, for how they would build new structures in part of the land that doesn't have anything on it right now. And so that their brain is 
on this topic right now. So it would be wow. really excellent to have them look around their space that they're in right now and apply some of those ideas. Cool. So, and then my other thing is, um, I was really fascinated when you said you're in your own water district. And I wonder if there's somebody in your organization that I can follow up with to learn more about that aspect. Yeah, just shoot me an email and uh, we'll, I'll get you in touch. Great, thank you. Dorothy had another question, Paul. It uh, looks like there was one before her too about is there any opportunity to reuse demoed materials like brick or wood. Um, in a lot of buildings, there are uh, opportunities you know, sometimes with wood, um, you know, the, the, the quality of it's really important. And sometimes it's made into something else. You can make it into furniture as opposed to using it for structural things like we did. Um, yeah, brick is, brick is a, you know, a good example of recycled, um, that, that is recyclable. We didn't happen to use that on ours because we wanted that more clean look. How do we get a tour of your building? So um, Katrina Emery in my uh, office handles all, all the tours. Um, right now we're doing the kind of industry specific tours, but uh, next year we'll, we'll start opening them up to the public. Um, so if Duke can get you in touch with me, I'll get you in touch with Karina. Uh, Katrina, I'm sorry, Karina's on the phone. I'm looking at Karina. Um, I so not, we have a, I, not, yeah. I lead tours. I do not organize yeah, exactly. tours. Exactly. So. <laughs> we have two. We have two Karinas. I work with and a Katrina, so yeah. I, I always get that <laughs> mixed up. So Katrina leads the uh, tours, and we'll get you in touch with her. Well, one more question. Uh, back to the water. What's the situation with water rights from rain? I was under the impression the state had those rights in Oregon. Um, it, was, it was actually a big problem in, in Colorado. Um, I, um, I do not believe it was the same problem. And I don't recall, recall it coming up in the design at all um, no, in Oregon. Think, and we've, again, rainwater capture in Oregon is not that unusual, but yes, Colorado River Basin, so that's Nevada, um, uh, Colorado, even in Arizona, New Mexico, ironically, um, in those states, it is very difficult to do um, rainwater capture and reuse because of, um, you know, 120 year old water rights laws. So there's, yeah, there's definitely some interesting intersection between um, design and policy and all that sort of stuff with some of these problems. Okay, I think we got to wrap. Well, Paul and Karina, thank you so much. Uh, we're recording this. We'll publish that. Uh, uh, I'll include Paul and Karina's emails so that uh, they can get inundated <laughs> with quite a, more questions. But we have an amazing resource here in town uh, with these folks, and they've been doing it a long time. And, uh, so it, it's a real pleasure to have worked with them. Thanks so much for having us. Dick. really appreciate the invite and for all the work you've done in this in this field. And um, we really appreciate uh, what you do. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so that's a wrap. I'm going to close us out here. All right, have a good